Good evening, and welcome to tonight's debate. I'm your moderator, Pierre Korosak. Now let's meet our candidates. Please welcome George Smith and Cornelius Pink. Welcome, gentlemen. <clears throat> the first question is about the environment. If elected, what would you do to keep our air clean? You first, Mrs. Smith. Well, first I'd like to say thank you for having yes, me. Yes, I'm glad you asked that question, Pierre, because my plan for reforming the car industry will make all highways work like Hot Wheel tracks. In fact, I have a video I want to show you right now. Here, go ahead and go ahead and roll that tape. Um. Mr. Pink, we don't have a lot of time here. Roll, roll tape. Okay. Hot Wheels. A cool miniaturized toy to play with when it came out in the 1960s and 70s. Since the original first 16 have been made, there have been plenty of duplicates. Hey, cool. Duplicates. Yeah, I want to be duplicated too. Anyway, here are a couple of collectors, and for their own reasons, they've been put into the Collectors Anonymous. But they have been nice enough to tell us of their collections. At this time, I have a little over 1,200 cars, individuals as well as uh, sets. They come out with sets sometimes, gift sets and collectibles and overall it's over 1,200 different vehicles, not one repeat. The, the red line on the uh, tires is a, um, was a trademark of Mattel for their tires. The originals came out with red lines. In 1971, they started phasing out the red lines on the tires, I'm sure, you know, to save money. Uh, the cars, when they introduced, cost about a dollar. Today, they still cost about a dollar each, uh, 35, no, 40 years later. 40 years later, they still cost about a dollar each, which is kind of interesting. Started collecting Hot Wheel cars in about 1993 and tried to get one of each car that was available for every year from then on out. Hot Wheels has come out with many different series. Uh, one was like a billboard series where like a, you'd get a blimp and you could turn the tail on it and it would show a different picture, stuff like that, or a, like a trucking truck and it could flip. But uh, one of the real popular ones that are real hard to get is called the Treasure Hunt Series. They started off with 12 cars, 12 different cars, and only 10,000 of each car worldwide. And usually one car came per case. So it was kind of hard to get them. And it still is unless you go online. but. You'd have to go to the store right when they got the cars, so you could search through the boxes. Um, Mattel came out with Hot Wheels in 1968. During the 1950s and 60s, uh, Matchbox cars were the most well-known and most collected die-cast model cars. Mattel was a uh, already a big company, well-known company, and they came out with the die-cast cars with special bearings on their wheels. So they were introduced as the fastest die-cast cars. That's how they were um, touted when they came out. They came out with uh, 16 different vehicles in that year, the first year. The first one being a Camaro, what was called the Custom Camaro. The first, and it was made in either Hong Kong or the United States. This is more like it here. Okay. Right here is a, it's a serial, series number, but the collector number uh, is also one of them when you catalog, go in the catalog to find out through Mattel what it is, that, that will show that and then it will say the different variations, like this has no spokes on the on the wheels and it's a, let's call it a magenta color with a silver lower. There was blue ones, this one happens to have a clear windshield, it may, there were some with blue windshields, green windshields, uh, the interior's tan, some of them might have been black. This one was made in Malaysia, some of them may have been made in the U.S. It's a 300, uh, 380 SEL Mercedes is what the car is.
Even though Kyle Petty is the original Hot Wheels driver, none of the cars would have been started without Elliot Handler, the co-founder of Mattel, whose bosses originally thought the cars were not such a great idea. This has been Matt LeDuc with Hot Wheels. And, and, and that's what happens? Um, okay. What, how do you get the cars back to the top of the well, This hill, brings me to my next point, our civil transit. I have a great way of improving our civil transit. Whoa, wait, Mr. Pink, there's more questions we need to get to. We need to build an underground railroad. <laughs> what? You know, the, uh, the railroad that goes underground. Okay, hold on. do you even know what that is? Oh, no, 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 wait, wait, hold on. We got it. We got We have a tape. Hold on, Jim. We don't really have time for this. So here, roll, roll the tape. Roll the tape. I'm about to talk to um, Patsy Chapman, who does the research for Underground Railroad. Um, I was intrigued by the story of the Underground Railroad um, while living in Texas because Texas cherishes its history. I learned more about it as my kids went to school uh, and, and um, you know, while I was there in Texas. So I began doing the research once I returned and retired from my position uh, as a police officer uh, from Houston. I came back and began doing research on the Underground Railroad. And what I was basically looking for was one story about uh, community involvement with the whole process of the Underground Railroad. But what I found was an incredible story about many individuals that represent St. Clair County from all walks of life and all races. The story about the Underground Railroad is a story about heroes, heroes that came from all walks of life, who sacrificed everything they had in order to correct a terrible wrong that, was, that plagued this country for almost 300 years, for over 300 years. These people were white, black, Hispanic, Native American, um, from all walks of life, uh, rich and poor, um, who did this, who came together and communicated. With, within 30 to 40 years, as a result of this operation, the Underground Railroad, it end came to slavery in this country. If not, if it had not been for those individuals, who dedicated themselves to this cause, then it's really um, a thought that, um, that exists even today that maybe slavery would not be over in the present day life in this country. I generally give lectures throughout the community uh, from St. Clair County to Macomb County. Um, I've even given lectures in Chatham, Ontario and in Sarnia, Ontario. Uh, regarding the Underground Railroad and the involvement of local people um, in this area. Thanks for watching. That's all the time we have, ladies and gentlemen. Today. Wait, wait, wait. I just have one more closing statement. I'd just like to inform you all that I have a better theme song than my opponent. How, how does that have to do with the issues at hand here? What, what are you talking about? Do you, do you even know how much time and effort goes into producing and writing a song and then... Here, show, yeah. go ahead and show that video. Oh, no, we don't have time to show a video. There's no time at all. Rah, 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 rah. No time no, for video. Roll the video. Roll. No! No time for video! Hi, I'm Josiah Kreidler and today I'm going to talk to you about the art of recording music and how today's technology has influenced the industry of recording arts. It's been a big uh, change uh, just since I've been doing uh, work in the business. I've been working in uh, audio for live events and for recorded, uh, you know, media, whether television or uh, broadcast or other uh, situations where, you know, it was unheard of to be able to multi-track record a concert live event with anything but a huge 
mobile truck that had two inch tape machines and you know things like the the, the tape alone for a half hour of, of recording was two hundred three hundred dollars uh, and you couldn't just get it anywhere you know you, you'd have to uh, you know if you're out of tape you're out of luck usually uh, on the day of the show and now we've got you know software recording uh, you can buy an off-the-shelf drive from you know Best Buy or something and have a couple hours of recording time you know in our business and and for the musician at home you know it's been where you know if you were Mozart and you could th hear things in your mind and just write them all down on, on a sheet of paper well that's great but now a guy can sit in his, in his uh, bedroom and compose and hear an arrangement that he's coming up with all uh, whether he's recording just MIDI instrument tracks or live audio uh, everybody's got a multi-track recorder um, in their house uh, just sitting there at the computer uh, it's fascinating you know when the Beatles recorded uh, I think Sgt. Pepper was one of the first multi-track recorded albums and uh, they had a four track tape machine Another thing that's characterized the record industry of today is Musical Instrument Digital Interface, or MIDI, also called Synthesis. When you record an instrument like a guitar, the information collected for playback is an audio waveform, whereas on a MIDI track, computer data tells the system what sounds to make. Those little bars on the computer screen are MIDI data, and they are what make the sound of the piano, even though no keys were ever played. The old school was you'd go to a big studio, you know, you'd get a record deal, they'd pay for the big studio time you couldn't afford yourself, and, and you'd go in and make your record. And uh, places like the Hit Factory in New York had, you know, a million and a half dollar mixing console that was automated, and these multi-track tape machines that were linked together. You might have had two 48-track digital machines or two 24-track analog machines locked together to get you enough channels or whatever you wanted to record and now you can do that on on a computer for five hundred dollars you know the, the hit factory in new york city is one of the you know they've, they've kind of to me when they went out of business that really signaled that yeah this is a real deal this this stuff is gonna uh... you know take over the music recording industry because uh... you've got automated mixing and and all the recording capabilities of that situation uh, for a $500 piece of software and maybe a $2,000 computer. So whether you're a big name contract holding artist or just a local musician trying to get your name out, things have gotten a lot easier for you over the years. Once again, I'm Josiah Kreiler and you're watching the No Talent Show on Channel 6. Well, thank you for t watching tonight's debate. Be sure to go out and vote tomorrow. Wait, what are, are you guys running for anyway? Well, mm, um, I'm running for... Um, uh, thank um, you guys for having us tonight, and uh, vote for Pink, everybody. Thank you. No, no, don't vote for Pink. No, he ran too many videos. There's not enough evidence. No, oh, yeah, and play my theme song. No, don't play his theme song. No, don't. Don't play his theme song. Don't. No, he can't. No, no, don't. Don't play his theme song. Don't. No, he can't. No. No, no. Ah. Uh, don't you like this, huh? No, no, I don't. No, no. Someone turn the music off. Someone turn this music off. Turn the music off. Someone. Hey, hey. Anyone? Hello. Turn the music off. No. What are you doing? No. No. No.